Alto Harbour of Mrs. My Ear in Radio was taken in 1950s British science fiction paperbacks. Uh, this video is going to discuss a series of 10 books published in 1953-54, which are extremely rare. And I fancy that most people watching this won't ever have seen copies. Here we see the covers of the Gannett Press series, all 10 that were published. They were all uh, highly indicative of the overall standard of the novels. Ridiculous rubbish. Now I've no doubt that American collectors may not share my personal opinion about these vintage covers. They think that these awful covers are cool. Admittedly, at first glance, these covers may appear to be eye-catching and colourful, but they besmirch everything that good science fiction art should be. Because of books like these, all early 1950s British science fiction was unfairly tarred with the same brush. Let's take a closer look at these cool covers. The Brains of Hell. Just look at that ridiculous spaceship. One third of the ship has a transparent nose cone with nothing inside it. The three pilots of the ship are encased in giant test tubes. Not very practical to combat solar flares and cosmic radiation whilst in outer space. The X people. This shows a spaceship with all four rocket tubes blasting it forwards and down, the crash into an observation dome on some planet, apparently inhabited by ants or beetles. The two pilots, Kami and Kazi, appear totally unconcerned at their impending disintegration, as does the observer in the dome. This man is wearing a goldfish bolt space helmet beloved of juvenile comic strips. Note that it ends in a tight metal neck collar, thus making it physically impossible for the man to either take off the helmet or to get his head inside it in the first place. The inverted commas artist was Gerald Facey. Cast away from space shows our old artist friend Ray Theobald of Curtis Warren infamy at his most idiotic. Here we have scantily clad blondes being kidnapped from an asteroid by men with rockets strapped on their back, carrying them into the vacuum of outer space, thus guaranteeing their horrible and messy deaths, as their unprotected bodies would be ravaged in the airless void. Pirates of Cerebus. Here we have something of a novelty and that Theobald's cover actually illustrates a scene in the story. But wouldn't you just know it, this novel was the worst science fiction novel ever to be written and published. More on that later. Far Beyond the Blue shows Theobald's usual vacuous blonde being menaced by a red-eyed green robot. Yuck. For worlds away, Theobald varies his technique by replacing his favourite blonde with a bewhiskered, green-skinned green -skinned alien wearing a purple loincloth, being attacked by a futuristic foreign legionnaire. Note the other character's utterly deformed left arm. The man appears to have no elbow, exposing the artist's limited depiction of correct anatomy. Spaceflight 139 sports a colourful cover by Philip Mendoza, who was a fine artist, but very weak on painting spaceships. This one looks like it was modelled on a dart. Odyssey in Space. This cover shows Theobald's idea of an iconic science fiction image. A blonde in a red bikini with a matching saucy red hat, a man in bathing trunks and a fully clothed scientist working at a console. At a couple of battling spaceships, 
and a shoddy satin with a wonky ring and you have another cool cover. Trouble Planet was a shoddy rehash of Facey's dinosaur spaceship cover for Curtis Warren's Dennis Hughes novel Purple Islands published a few years earlier. So we can see it here. He rehashed the same cover. And of course a ridiculous cover. Global Blackout as Theobald's uh, cover, but this manages to avoid his usual mockery of science with a somewhat restrained, sensible picture, very commendable. Now, what of the novels themselves? As I previously revealed in another video, the man behind Gannett was B.Z. Emanuel, who had lost control of Skyen when it was hit by a fine for publishing gangster obscenity. He quickly formed his own new imprint, Gannett Press, but was struggling from the outset. All of Skyen's best writers had defected from him because of his failure to pay on time. So the only people prepared to write for him were second stringers. The genial journeyman Norman Lazenby was prepared to write for anyone, however. He was one of the few writers who answered Emanuel's appeals for manuscripts. He supplied this first science fiction novel by quickly cobbling together two short stories that had previously been published by bottom end publisher John Spencer in the infamous collections Worlds of Fantasy and Futuristic Science Stories. We can see these uh, origins of that novel here. Futuristic science story featuring planet, planet men, uh, plasma men bring death. That's one story, and the other story was find the place. Gods of Hell, bit of a giveaway by Norman Lazenby. Now, what about the novel itself? Brains of Hell by the absurdly named Bengo Mistral, Emmanuel's choice of a science fiction house name for Lazenby, uh, was a peculiar novel. Lazenby had a nice sense of humour, and this absurd space opera has more than a touch of Alice in Wonderland about it, and some nice satirical touches. It was not to be taken seriously, but it's actually quite interesting and amusing. Not so amusing was the fact that Lazenby had to threaten legal action to obtain his £35 payment, which finally was paid to him six months after it was legally due. The X people introduced another Gannett House name absurdity, Vectis Brack. This is a silly, complicated space opera written in a heavily padded, soporific style. It's so dull as to be unreadable. Cast Away from Space, another shockingly bad, dull, silly space opera, which occupies only the first 109 of the 128 pages. It was padded out by an almost illiterate anonymous short story, The Terrors of Marina, Mar Marinda, that is a crime against science fiction and which makes no sense whatsoever. Pirates of Cerebus by Juan B. Ward, hiding behind the Bengo house name, makes the foregoing novels read like Hugo winners in comparison. The book's hero, Caspar Carlyon, is a very unusual hero indeed. I quote, Carlyon, like all Martians, a brown-skinned giant of six hectares high. My dictionary, the author's spelling throughout the book shows that he didn't possess a dictionary, defines a hectare as a unit of area equal to 10,000 square metres. And Bengo tells us, that Carlion is six hectares high. A giant indeed. 
Here's another quote. Colian has given an order to the crew of his spaceship. Head for Cerebus, the first inhabited planet beyond the atmosphere, Colian observed briefly, his shrewd eyes scanning the telescreen for traces of other craft, airborne in the intense blue vastness of outer space. First time I've heard that outer space was blue. Here's another quote after they've landed on Cerebus and witness mobile carnivorous plants devouring the body of, I quote again, a blue-skinned Plutonian whose orange hair in an inkept mop shone vividly on the lush green vegetation of the clearing. With weird excited whistling sounds, the plant bowed over the body its four now scarlet flowers closing in on the body greedily, petals caressing with the almost tender movements of a kiss, the blue skin of the dead pirate. The plants then threatened Collian and his men, so they dashed to the spaceship to escape, and Collian states his intention to take off. I quote again, but he found he was not alone as he took up position before the control board, inserted the ignition key and revved up the engine, warming her up for immediate takeoff into space. Zelda, her soft comely breasts rising and falling rapidly beneath their torn flimsy coverings, stood beside him, her eyes alight with tenderness. Not yet convinced that this book is the worst science fiction novel ever written, then how about this final quote? describing the man in charge of the space patrol. General Vigo, a tall, snowy-haired albino from Uranal, fourth satellite moon of Saturn. Oh, God. Far Beyond the Blue by Drax Ampere almost rivals Bengo's in mind-numbing offensive mediocrity. It involves one Captain Nick Berry of the Space Patrol, a sexually repressed boy scout type, much given to talking to himself, uttering fatuous ejaculations such as, By dying Mars! Other characters include the snowy haired Professor Malkett, one of Britain's brainiest scientific research workers, besides being the father of a remarkably pretty daughter. One candy, whose wide-set blue eyes and full warm lips combine to give an effect of luscious beauty. The alien villains include a half-beast half-man and his hornet woman mistress, Selina Dumas. Written with appalling gangsterese, this ghastly book contains scenes, contains scenes of interspecies rape and sleazy eroticism juxtaposed with juvenile space opera. In Worlds Away, after a maiden flight into space, the crew of the spaceship return to Earth and find they have aged 50 years for no apparent reason. A peculiar, confusing story that wastes its one bright idea of sentient energy creatures. In Space Flight 139, the spaceship sets out to try and find a newly discovered planet in the solar system. Whilst almost competently written, the author displays only the haziest knowledge of astronomy or science fiction tropes. Odyssey of Space is one of the best written of the Gannett novels. It concerns the successful construction of a manned space station by a group of men and women, led by scientist Alva Mitrix, working in secret from an island base. But traitors within his organisation defect with all his construction plans and the spacecraft designs and sell them to foreign powers. Soon many of the countries are involved in a space race to launch their own space platforms, ostensibly for warlike purposes. The novel, which is carefully written and plausible, suddenly falls apart in the last chapter 
when Mitrix deduces that world war will break out and decides to play God, he destroys all life on Earth from space. His plan is for himself and his wife to become a new Adam and Eve. Trouble Planet is a low-key, slow-moving mystery in which a special agent is sent undercover to investigate Earth's Martian colony. He uncovers political intrigues involving a very unlikely alien race living on an asteroid. Apart from this one abs absurdity, the story is otherwise scientifically accurate, but it's also predictable and rather dull. In global blackout, the world is suddenly plunged into total darkness by some unknown cause. One of the characters, a radio astronomer, conjectures that it might be caused by a polarising radiation being transmitted from Alpha Centauri by alien scientists, either by accident or design. This is a well-written, intelligent book focusing on a small group of ordinary, believable people undergoing a nightmare struggle for survival and the search for food and water and shelter in a world in which the, everyone is blind. It is survival of the fittest as bands of men move from one house to another, looting and killing. The radio astronomer initiates a worldwide transmission of what may be a heterodyning beam aimed at Alpha Centauri to cancel out the radiation that is blacked out light waves. Eventually, after a few weeks, light does indeed return and all is well. This book was a pleasant surprise in the Gannett list after so much preceding rubbish. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, it was also the last book. It's perhaps the only one of the 10 books actually worth reading. It has been conjectured that it may have been written by Michael Harrison, an established author. But how and why he would have delivered his manuscript for Gannett is to remain forever a mystery.